away as Las Vegas and San Diego. All I can say is I was born and raised in California, and it's, in 26 years, this is one of the strongest ones that I remember, and I, God forbid, I hope nothing uh, hits us any harder. A television news crew in Los Angeles was doing a story at the L.A. County Jail at the time the quake hit. Oh, that was a shaker. Whoa, oh, whoa. Oh. And several Los Angeles reporters were live on the air updating the earthquake when the aftershocks hit. There are power outages. Oh, here comes one right now. Son of a... Wow. Oh, boy. Wow. That's... Uh, oh. And here's another aftershock or another earthquake uh, happening right now. I'm not sure which. I'm going to get under this desk. I apologize for the theatrics. Okay. This is live. This is what's happening right now. <laughs> and a word to the folks in the control room, if you're going to swear, we can hear it uh, on the air, so we'll try to keep a sense of decorum. Christina, do you have any copy, any wire copy that's coming right now? Nothing. Nothing. As for right now, portions of two freeways have been closed because structural damage is feared. There were some 35 traffic accidents reported today. Of the 67 natural gas fires that began, all are now under control, and only this one in a shopping mall was considered serious. Most authorities say this could have been much worse. The 1971 earthquake measured 6.4 on the Richter scale, compared to today, 6.1. That quake claimed 64 lives. There will likely be more aftershocks in the Los Angeles area in the coming days. There are about 15 of them today. There is also, according to a Cal State geophysicist, a 1 in 20 chance of an even larger quake within five days. Chet? All right, thank you, Martha. Five minutes after the California quake began, the first wave rippled across the, coast, or across the country to the east coast. It was recorded yeah. at Boston College's Western Observatory as a small glitch. Yeah. Experts say waves from the west coast earthquake traveled at about four miles a second before reaching our region. The first uh, group of waves that came in are waves that travel through the earth. They're pushing and pulling, compression, dilation waves traveling through the earth. And uh, then after the elapse of a certain, uh, a few minutes, uh, other waves came in. And these waves are waves which have traveled over the earth's surface. Underground, scientists say the earthquake barely moved the earth the thickness of a sheet of paper, but the effect which was magnified was much greater on the surface. New Center 5 science editor Dr. Michael Gillen says seismologists are trying to decide if this earthquake is a warning of perhaps bigger ones to come. The pressure, the stress builds up over time, over decades, and then finally it snaps. And the San Andreas Fault has not snapped really well since 1857, and that's why seismologists think it's due to snap within the next couple decades. Now, whether this earthquake today was a foreshock to the big quake or whether it simply relieved stress built up in a fault in the L.A. system, we're not sure yet. Now, the big one, which scientists believe will hit before the year 2000, is expected to be a hundred times greater than today's earthquake. Reports of damage are changing by the hour. We will, of course, keep you updated. ABC's World News Tonight will have more right after this broadcast and... A new Center Fives Entertainment editor, Dixie Huntley, who grew up in Los Angeles, just happened to be in Los Angeles on assignment this morning. And we're trying to get a live report from Dixie before the conclusion of this broadcast. Natalie? Our other top story tonight concerns more fallout from the Biden tape incident, which sent the Dukakis presidential campaign reeling yesterday. We now know a third top campaign official was involved in sending out at least one of the tapes, but he has not resigned. We get a report from New Center Fives' Kirby Perkins, who has spent this day after with the governor. On the sidewalk outside his Boston campaign headquarters, the governor was surrounded by those seeking the very latest on this day two of the Duke's video gate crisis. At issue today, who else played a role in the making or sending out of those Biden attack tapes? The answer from the governor today, one more. Jack Corrigan, the campaign's popular field director, John Sasso's right-hand man. Corrigan is seen here yesterday, right after the emotional press conference by his fallen mentor, John Sasso. Although he had no prior knowledge of the tapes which went to the Times and the Register, he did, at John Sasso's direction, mail a tape to NBC. Uh, that was a mistake, but in my judgment, not a mistake that warrants dismissal from the campaign. So unlike Sasso and Paul Tully, Jack Corrigan stays on. But what about the campaign's press secretary, Pat O'Brien? She also has been rumored to be an active participant in the Biden affair. 
I beg I your pardon? I have no involvement in this. We want the juice! We want the juice! We want the juice! After today's grilling by the local press, the Democrats' best finance presidential candidate left town flying by corporate jet to Hartford, Connecticut, where he received the kind of greeting a troubled candidate appreciates most. The caucus was warmly applauded and then endorsed by 37 members of the Connecticut legislature, including the speaker and the Senate president. But the endorsement was followed by more questions about the Biden attack. Here the governor gave his most personal explanation of his initial unwillingness to accept John Sasso's resignation. I mean, John Sasso was the closest thing to a brother to me that I have in this world. And when that's the case... I usually respond with what I hope is decency and sensitivity, and I tried to in this case. The governor says he is moving on. He goes to Iowa tonight. The questions are sure to follow. In Hartford, Connecticut, Kirby Perkins, News Center 5. At his earlier news conference in Boston, Governor Dukakis was asked about reports that his wife Kitty had seen the Kinnick-Biden tape before it was distributed to, by Sasso to the media. The governor said he had no knowledge that that had happened. Yesterday's events were today's headlines, but once the Biden tape story is out of the media spotlight, what kind of impact will it have on voters? News Center 5 Susan Warnick reports that some political experts believe the media interest in this story far outweighs the concern of the average voter. As expected, yesterday's revelation that John Sasso leaked the Biden tapes to the media was front page news today. An unusual front page editorial in the Herald described the Dukakis campaign as badly hurt. A commentary in the Boston Globe called it badly wounded. Even the New York Times played the story above the fold. And the subject filled the airwaves for most of the day on the radio. Why don't we just leave it alone? Why don't, we, why, don't, why don't the media and everyone just back off and let the Democrats take care of the Democrats? They're going to cut each other's throat. The Dukakis controversy was big elsewhere as well. Television newscasts around the country featured it as a top story. Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis tonight is looking for a new campaign manager to run his presidential campaign. At a Boston news conference today, Dukakis announced he had accepted the... By chance, we ran into a tour group from Iowa in Boston today. They found the story interesting, but no big deal. I really don't think it will affect him too much. In my own personal opinion, I, I myself, uh, I would stay with Dukakis. Political analysts believe most people are paying little attention to the Dukakis matter, and those who are have a vested interest. Well, largely it's the political community. Um, that is the maybe five million at most people who report on campaigns, participate in campaigns, uh, give money to campaigns, uh, and follow everything that happens in campaigns, political junkies. Hertzberg thinks the long list of presidential candidates is confusing to most people, and few will remember this incident. John Sasso has been Michael Dukakis's chief political aide for seven years. His leaving is seen as the biggest threat to the campaign. His departure produces a big hole, a major deficit for the campaign organizationally that would be very difficult, perhaps impossible to fill. At this point, the Dukakis campaign has not yet found anyone to replace John Sasso. The new Center 5 has learned the feelers went out to Bob Beckel, former campaign manager, to then-presidential candidate Walter Mondale. He let the Dukakis people know he is not interested. Other names being mentioned tonight are New Hampshire Democratic Party Chairman Joe Grandmaison, also Tom Kiley, partner of John Martilla, who had been a top advisor to Joe Biden, and another name, Kirk O'Donnell, who was a former top aide to former House Speaker Tip O'Neill and also to former Boston Mayor Kevin White. Natalie? Thank you, Susan. On the New England Newsline tonight, there is no progress to report tonight on the 48-hour marathon negotiating session now underway in an effort to end the three-week-old strike by Boston school bus drivers. The drivers say they're optimistic about a settlement, but bus company officials had no comment before the talks got underway this morning. The school department says if a new contract isn't hammered out by the end of this session, they will go ahead with a plan to hire new drivers. The president of the Boston-based Capital Bank and Trust Company today pled not guilty to charges of assault and battery. 
50-year-old Carl Walczek was arraigned in Boston Municipal Court this morning. The former employee at the bank claims that Walczek assaulted her at an employee conference in July, allegedly grabbing her around the neck and pulling at her dress. The case has been continued until October 21st. Walczek is free on his own recognizance. An air traffic controller at the Boston Center in Nashua, New Hampshire, has been relieved of duty after allowing an Eastern Airlines jet to fly too close to a military cargo plane this week. The planes flew within 500 feet of each other Tuesday night, forcing the Eastern pilot to bank sharply. The FAA says this is the second time this unidentified controller has been involved in such an incident. Well, throughout this week, the two-week-old uh, two NFL strike, members of the New England Patriots have pledged unity and solidarity. Now, tonight, that pledge has been broken. Sports Center 5's Mike Lynch joins us with the story. I think the players were probably waiting for some leader around the league to go in. Tony Dorsett went in today. Danny White went in yesterday. Gastineau went in last week. And today, Tony Collins crossed the picket line. There's going to be more tomorrow, too, Chet. Collins is the first crack in the Patriots player. Solidarity. He crossed this morning. He worked out with the substitute players this afternoon. As many as five more players are expected to show up at Sullivan Stadium tomorrow, and it could be as many as a dozen by Sunday. The active roster will be made at noon tomorrow, so anybody that wants to play Sunday against the Browns has to be in by noon tomorrow. But any player that shows up by game time Sunday will be paid. Collins tossed last night and came in First this decision, morning. Uh, I feel that uh, right now, the way the things are going with the strike, uh, I'm not too pleased with it. At the same time, I'm, you know, I'm, I still feel for the my fellow teammates, and uh, you know, I respect where they stand, and I, re I hope they respect where I stand. It's a, I think it's great. I think it's great. I hope a lot of other guys do it. Do you foresee that happening? I uh, I hope it happens. I I think that uh, uh, it's in the interest of the Patriots. I think it's in the interest of the players that they be playing football. And however that happens, as soon as possible, is is in the interest of. The players, the fans, their families, uh, and our family. Well, it will happen tomorrow. Some big-name Patriot players will be in tomorrow. And coming up in sports, we're going to talk live with Tony Collins' running mate in the back backfield, Mosi Tatupo. We'll talk with him live and get his sentiments about his teammate crossing the picket line. Should be interesting. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Lots more still ahead tonight, including another entry into the presidential race. Also, the undecided votes are taking sides in the Bork nomination at later part four of our exclusive look inside Bridgewater. Tonight, we're protected from the patients by fences, but who protects the guards? That story is coming up. Come to Midas and save 25% on all mufflers, 15% on all shocks and struts, and 10% on all brake work, only at Midas. I stay in the car. Since you're not driving a new Nissan car or truck, I'm going to have to give you a warning. Your New England Nissan factory-to-dealer incentives can save you hundreds on new cars like Sentra, ranked number one for quality. If you don't get in there, I'm going to have to take you in for questioning. I mean, don't you like money? Can we really trust someone like you on the road? Your New England Nissan dealers can. Yes, we can. Yes. What kind of dog is that? <laughs> it's your date? Oh. With Snapper Lawn Products, you can throw away your rake. Fall cleanup is a snap. With high back to pick up leaves, autumn chores become a breeze. It's a snap with a snapper. Sir, would you choose hamburger A, a Wendy's hamburger made with fresh beef, or hamburger B made with beef that's been frozen? B, phenomenal investment potential in frozen beef. Think about it. The other guy's paying top dollar for fresh. I snatch up this baby when nobody else will touch it. But isn't fresh better? That's the beauty. First thing you know, you got to run on fresh beef. Supplies dry up. Bingo. I got frozen. I'm sitting on a gold mine. Most people like the taste of hamburgers made with fresh beef, like Wendy's, the best burgers in the business. Down south, it's soda, and up north, it's tonic. But at Zare, it's just $4.96 a case, and at that price, I'd call it a deal. Zare, how little it costs. TV evangelist Pat Robertson says, count him in. Robertson officially announced his bid for the Republican presidential nomination today in New York. He then flew on to New Hampshire, where New Center 5's Shirley McNerney now joins us live from Manchester. Shirley? 
Well, Pat Robertson is here in Manchester tonight to attend a fundraiser. By his own estimates, he has already raised and spent some $10 million. And some political analysts believe that while he may not win, he certainly will be a factor, possibly drawing support from other candidates. He made his announcement in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, and he set the tone of his campaign. I believe the time has come when we as a nation go back to the fundamental moral values that have made this nation great. But as he set forth his philosophy, a group of hecklers standing on the sides chanted, Go home, go home, and carried anti-Robertson signs, one of which said, Hitler in 39, Robertson in 88. Robertson represents the religious right, but beyond the labels, he is not well known by the general public. All this will change now with his candidacy. Here is a look at his background. Marion Gordon Robertson, known as Pat Robertson, was a young minister when he served in New York. His real fame came later when he turned a small TV station into a Christian broadcasting network. Robertson is a telegenic, charismatic preacher who once claimed to have warded off a hurricane. I felt, uh, interestingly enough, that if I uh, couldn't move a hurricane, I could hardly move a nation. His image belies a rather blue blood background. The preacher is a descendant of two American presidents, William and Benjamin Harrison. His father was a U.S. senator. Robertson graduated from Washington and Lee University and from the Yale University Law School. Yesterday, Robertson resigned his ordination as a Baptist minister, a move he explained this morning on the 700 Club, a show he used to host. And I knew that if somebody were offering himself for as high an office as the presidency and he were an ordained clergyman, it would be to many, many of our fellow citizens the signal that this was establishing the Baptist uh, faith uh, as the preferred uh, religion in America. And I just couldn't have that because I believe in religious freedom for all people in our country. In recent weeks, Robertson has shown a formidable ability to mobilize political support. He has outflanked his rivals in a straw poll in Iowa and in delegate selection in Michigan. But his greatest strength, the support of evangelical Christians, could be a liability with voters at large. Robertson has resigned from the cable network, but his former staff saluted him and his family on the 700 Club this morning and prayed for him in his new venture. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lay our hands upon our brother Pat Robertson, who has meant so much to all of us, Lord God. And in the name of Jesus, we just send him forth into all of the good things that you have before him, Lord God. I am here now with Pat Robertson. Mr. Robertson, on balance, in view of the heckling, do you think it was a good idea to go to Bedford-Stuyvesant? I want to be known as somebody who's not afraid to take a risk. Of course, it's a risk to go down to an inner city uh, ghetto area, but I live there, my family, and they came back with me because I care about cities. The truth is, the hecklers, there were 50 gays and lesbians, well organized. They all knew each other. They didn't live in Bedford Stuyvesant. They, were, they moved in from someplace else, and I'm not going to let the streets of America be given over to a bunch of radical left wingers. And I, I was saying, I'm going to the streets. I care about the inner cities, the poor, those who need education. Education. I want to give an opportunity for all Americans. And that's what I was saying. Those people even booed the national anthem. I mean, you know, that, that, that's the kind of people they were. Mr. Robertson, speaking of taking risks, do yeah. you think the American public is ready for a minister as president? Well, they probably are not. That's why I resigned uh, my ordination this week. Uh, there's a deeply okay. uh, established... We'll follow uh, up on this okay, later if you ahead. don't mind. Go Pat ahead. Robertson is now declared as a presidential candidate running on the Republican side. Live from Manchester, Shirley McNerney, News Center 5. All right, thank you, Shirley. Topping the national news line tonight, a severe setback to the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Robert Bork. Four senators, including a key Republican... The day went on the record against Bork. Three Southern Democrats who had been undecided declared they no longer were. My problem with Judge Bork is that he does not stick with his views. Over and over I get the impression that he follows his narrow interpretation only when it leads to the result he wishes it to lead to. Senators Bennett Johnson of Louisiana and David Pryor of Arkansas also came out against Bork today, and Senator Arlen Specter, the only Republican on the Senate Judiciary who had been undecided, also said today he will vote no. Leading Republicans are still claiming they have the edge in the Bork nomination. Federal Judge William Sessions was supposed to be sworn in today as FBI Director. Instead, 
He's in a Washington hospital suffering from an ulcer attack. The 57-year-old Sessions became ill last night on a flight from Texas to Washington. His wife Alice visited him today at George Washington University Hospital and says her husband is doing well. White House spokesman says that Sessions will be sworn in at a later date. Coming up right after this break, a beautiful day tomorrow, then a partly beautiful weekend. And Dick Albert, his forecast is coming up next. And later, where were you 20 years ago today? If you were in Boston, you probably remember it well. Clark Booth will take a look back a little later. Zero. Zilch. None? Nada. Really? Really? Tell me something. What? What are we talking about? <laughs> Colombo introduces a new yogurt with no fat. Colombo light. Real fruit? Not. All natural? Naturally. Tasty? Colombo. Colombo. New Colombo non-fat light yogurt. What makes it so good is what we left out. What did they leave out? The fat. The fat. The fat. It has no fat. Like me. Yeah. Right. America's modern-day Navy is under fire. Under fire from critics who say we're wasting billions of dollars. We're building the wrong kind of a Navy. And under fire from experts who say our ships are sitting ducks. I'm Chet Curtis. Hit the deck of a billion-dollar aircraft carrier. Enter the secret confines of a nuclear attack submarine. And examine America's role in the Persian Gulf. Find out if today's high-tech Navy has the right stuff. The Navy under fire. When you Center 5 reports Monday at 6. A star is born. Regal. It's the only one of its kind. Catch it. Now coming to your key Buick dealers. Canada's smallest province is one of its most picturesque. Join us for main streets and back roads of Prince Edward Island. On Chronicle, tonight at 7.30. Everyone's idea of the perfect car may be different, but on gasolines, people often agree. Thanks, Dad. Which is why Americans have made show the best-selling gasolines in the country. Tommy, the big day at last. Couldn't have done it without you. Maybe it's the patented additive package. And I'm starting it off right. Or the way you feel your car perform. Whatever it is, it's the difference between being America's best-selling gasolines or just one of the rest. Shell, experience the difference. While the competition's prices are rising, the price of a new Plymouth Reliant is coming down. Introducing the 88 Plymouth Reliant America. We're doing what no one else is adding equipment and reducing the price. So you save $13.69, plus you get the 770 protection plan. Compare Reliant America at $69.95 and the competition is priced out of sight. Plymouth Reliant America, it's the best value in its class. Plymouth, the pride's inside. It's that time of year again, and Carol Reed is thinking ski. Save up to 75% on famous name ski wear and equipment at the Carol Reed Angle Ski Sale at the Sheraton Inn, Boxborough. So tell us how wonderful will our weekend be? Oh, it'll be fair. <laughs> Not great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it doesn't you. look like a wonderful weather weekend, uh, but, uh, you know, it's fall and we're going to get what we get here. Uh, I would like to say it's going to be in the 70s. We'll get a little brush of Indian summer, but it doesn't look that way. Look at from this afternoon, heavy rain showers and thunder showers over the Cape and the islands. But this stuff is moving away now. It'll end in the next couple of hours. But they had heavy thunder showers in Nantucket, and the weather watchers have phoned in. And in fact, uh, one of them, Charlie Olaf, we call him Stormy Charlie, said it was winding, gusting, not winding, but gusting up to 40 miles per hour in a thunder shower there. 55 degrees is about an hour ago. Saugus, 53, and in Gardner, it's cool, 51. It's cooling off. Down. Mount Washington, icy. Freezing drizzle and 29 degrees there. Boy, that is cold. And 52 at the present time in Worcester. Well, the western portion of the country is bone dry, but we have a yo-yo weather pattern in the east. We have a storm coming in here with cooling weather tonight, and then it gets warmer tomorrow, and then another storm system coming in for a part of Saturday and early Sunday, and then it changes again late Sunday and Monday. So things just kind of really changing quickly. Bye-bye to this storm. Cool breezes behind it. And then we have clear skies behind that. So tomorrow should be a pretty good day. But here's the rain system coming in for Saturday. All right, tomorrow, look west. There's the showers. But in New England, it should be nice. 60s up north, 65 to 70 in southern New England with a gusty wind. The weather watch close up from the Cape. Hyannis tomorrow, 66. Brockton, 69. And Milford, 69. It will be windy, but it will be 
comfortably mild. Here's my forecast now, right on through this up and coming weekend. Breezy and colder tonight in the 40s. And then tomorrow, well, we'll see a lot of sunshine, some clouds in the afternoon, 65 to 70 degrees, but there'll be a hefty wind out of the southwest. Tomorrow night, clouding up, maybe a shower late. Saturday, showers off and on in the low 60s. Sunday is a bit of a question mark. The storm should move out, giving us a little sunshine, but it will be kind of blustery. Okay, mm, not too right. bad overall, huh? Absolutely. All right, still ahead tonight, a break in the Patriots' picket line and the golden summer of 67. We'll have those reports ahead, but first, part four of Inside Bridgewater. Tonight, the men who keep watch over the patients, their fears and frustrations, next in our exclusive New Center 5 report. At Somerville Lumber, we're going to reward you. Save on your beautiful new bathroom now at Somerville Lumber. See the largest selection of complete top-to-bottom bathrooms, including fixtures, vanities, cabinets, and accessories on display to make your shopping easier and all at guaranteed low Somerville Lumber prices. Let our trained professionals help you with your bathroom project. And when you're through, we'll deliver it all absolutely free. Don't do it yourself without us. Somerville Lumber. Five days. That's all the time your key Buick dealers have to clear out every 87 Buick in stock. So, we're pulling out all the stops and giving you five days of pure, exhilarating sale excitement. Five, five days, days of unbelievably low clearance prices, 1.9% GMAC financing, and more for your trade than ever before. Five days. It's all the time we've got, and now it's the best time for you. See your key Buick dealer now. How many ways can Snapper help you this fall? You can snapperize your leaves, stack and sack them up with ease. It's a snap. You can twin back from the ground, clean and vacuum all around. It's a snap with a snapper. With versatile Snapper lawn products, you can throw away your rake. Fall cleanup is a snap. Get leaf relief with a Snapper self-propelled. Specially priced at $399.95. You can clean up after mowing, clear the leaves off just by blowing. It's a snap with a snapper. You know, there's so many tasty ways to have oatmeal. Now you can have a different flavor every day of the week. But try telling that to her. She doesn't want to hear about maple and brown sugar and apples and cinnamon and blueberry and strawberry and banana. Do ya? She eats peaches and cream oatmeal every blessed morning. Don't you? You see, to me, it's the right thing to do. To her, it's the tasty way to do it. Quicker instant oatmeal. It's the right thing to do. Tonight we continue our exclusive investigation of conditions inside Bridgewater State Hospital. New Center 5 recently spent a week at that troubled facility interviewing patients and staff. The first time such access has been granted to the media in 20 years. Many of the Bridgewater patients have never been convicted of a crime, but the institution does have custody of criminals who have committed some of the most unspeakable crimes in the state's history. Bridgewater staff must deal with that constant danger while they try to take care of these men. And that's the issue that New Center 5's Ron Allen explores tonight as we take you inside Bridgewater. I'm not a danger to people in here because people here have never done nothing to me. The man wielding the sharp knife in the Bridgewater kitchen says he's killed more than two dozen people, maybe more. No one is sure just how many. How many others? There were several. They estimate 30 people have died as a result of my actions. He is the Commonwealth's most notorious serial killer, Kenneth Harrison. During a rampage of killing in the 1960s, his victims included a six-year-old girl and a nine-year-old boy. People who had bothered me or bothered my mother, I had to, I felt they had to seek revenge and get even with them one way or another. The reason that he, that he was doing all this stuff was that he was getting up enough nerve to kill his sister and her five children. He was like testing himself. That's the reason he gave me, anyhow. Police arrested Harrison before he killed his family. Doctors say he will never be released from Bridgewater. He is a homicidal maniac, a disease with no known cure. Name any heinous criminal in Massachusetts and he's probably been sent here. Locked steel doors secure every entrance. Barbed wire fences surround the perimeter. 
A sentry keeps watch from the tower. But once inside, Bridgewater is virtually an open campus where the staff meets these violent, irrational men one on one. And most people on the street don't appreciate the problems that you have to take. People say, oh, you got a major, you carry guns, you carry clubs, you carry this, you carry nothing. On average, one or two of these unarmed officers are the victims of patient assaults each day. A dozen are out each week recovering from injuries. We are open to sucker punching, uh, being taken hostage, all kinds of things that at any time. They, you know, you see the freedom they have in here. They could plan anything wanted to uh, isolate one or two or three officers. The severely disturbed patients outnumber them 10 to 1, and the officers have little specific training to deal with the mental illness that surrounds them. Ten of these guys got out and come back and broke out to rest, and I know guys that could probably get Huey helicopter. You've got a lot of vets in here, a lot of Vietnam vets in here, a lot of them, and I'm one of them. And these are dangerous guys. You're always aware of your environment. Uh, there's a hypervigilance that is normal for walking through the yard to always be aware of your surroundings. You don't know. It's unpredictable. And that level of danger has always been heightened because the staff has been expected to provide treatment for these men without the money needed to do the job. Throughout its 100-year history, Bridgewater's staff has been able to offer only minimal care. And until five patients died here this year, pleas for help went largely unanswered. Who do you fault for that? I, don't th I think fault, faulting anyone is uh, really counterproductive. I think uh, there, there are resource decisions that I know have been made over the course of years that perhaps I wouldn't have made, but uh, there are decisions that are made in, a, in the real world of government. Official neglect. For years, state government had recognized the deficiencies at Bridgewater, but chose not to act. It's kind of like over a period of time, the administrators, not so much the correctional officers, but the administrators just developed an indifference and an insensitivity to the needs of these patients. Now, to meet even the minimum standards of mental health hospitals, Bridgewater must double its budget and triple its staff, and a new facility may even be needed. For in this badly overcrowded institution, doctors are forced to see patients in converted laundry rooms. It takes a lot of hope uh, to come and work here every day. You know, you, you here your your chief enemy is to be overwhelmed by a sense of hopelessness. That sense of hopelessness is slowly being replaced by a cautious optimism because the staff has been hearing a lot about plans to increase funding for the institution. We'll have more on the Dukakis administration's plans for Bridgewater tomorrow night. One other note. Last night, we told you about Bridgewater's controversial use of solitary confinement, seclusion. An appeals court judge said today that the state is making a good faith effort to improve the treatment of patients in seclusion. That question has been the focus of a very bitter lawsuit for quite some time. Now, Ron, uh, what about this fellow, Ken Harrison, that you showed us at the beginning of the piece, of the serial killer? Why was he allowed to be working in the kitchen with a knife? A lot of people have asked that question. We asked the question, especially before we photographed him in the kitchen. Uh, the, the answer that we're given is that Mr. Harrison has been at Bridgewater for 18 years, and the institution has essentially stabilized his illness. He, as he said, he is not a danger to people there. He's only a danger to people who he perceives as a threat to his family, to his mother. Uh, the staff feels that that is not a dangerous situation for him to be in. At one time, he was even the prison barber. But if he were released from Bridgewater, <laughs> he could be a potential danger to some people. So Mr. Harrison will never be released from Bridgewater State Hospital. I think a lot of people f uh, forgot about the haircuts for a while there. <laughs> Perhaps so. All right, Ron, we'll check back with you tomorrow night. Good series. Thank you, Matt. All right, just ahead, a Patriot crosses the picket line. We'll get reaction from players live on the Eddie Andelman Show next in sports. Last year, the number one imported station wagon model in America didn't come from Volvo or Toyota or Nissan. The imported wagon model more Americans bought was a Subaru. And this year, we're doing something unheard of. We're putting our best-selling model, the Subaru Wagon, on sale. 
So right now you can get a great price on the imported wagon model more people buy than any other, even when it's not on sale. The Subaru Wagon Sale. Now get up to $1,500 cash back, plus $660 protection. You taste it and think, ah, oh, this takes hours. But it only takes minutes. I've never made anything so delicious. It's the sauce. The sauce is the secret. New custom cuisine from Bird's Eye. Start with your own chicken meat or fish, then add our vegetables with delectable sauces for a spectacular dinner. Chicken and herb sauce, beef oriental, shrimp Dijon. Now I'm a great cook. With custom cuisine, vegetables and sauces, dinner will never be the same. If you've thought about Europe, think about now. Because now TWA lets you enjoy England for a price that's simply smashing. Say bonjour to the unforgettable culture and cuisine of France. Or come to Italy, country of romance and history. Wherever you land, TWA gives you full 50% discounts on great restaurants, hotels, and more. So think about now. Think about today's TWA. Find out how good we really are. Main streets and back roads of Canada tonight at 7.30. Well, a Patriots veteran decides he wants to play ball on Sunday and pick up a paycheck. Tomorrow at noontime is the deadline to be active to play on Sunday. But if the players come in this weekend and show up for the game on Sunday, they get paid for it. So there could be many more players coming in tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. But Collins is the first player to cross the picket line, and he should have company tomorrow when as many as five other veterans are expected to cross. As for Collins, he agonized over his decision the past few nights before deciding to cross today. His motives are many as Jack Edwards tells us in this report. So much for solidarity. Patriots running back Tony Collins is no longer on strike, leaving the picketers to join the replacements. I talked to with my wife last night, and, you know, my family comes first. And, uh, and I also love the guys that I play with also, and it's a thing that uh, I had to make a decision on, and hopefully they can respect that. Will Collins play on Sunday? Uh, we test him and put him through the conditioning drills and see if he's ready. Does Barry have any qualms about him playing behind a makeshift line? None whatsoever. Collins definitely had qualms about returning, but decided to put the pads on again after thinking about how far he had come since beating a drug problem. Coach Barry has been uh, very good to me. Uh, I had a lot of personal problems during this offseason, and uh, he helped me out a whole lot. And I worked my butt off to, to get where I am today to, to, to be the person I am today and to get those personal problems behind me. And I worked real hard on the weights and conditioning. And just to have uh, the strike mess that up for me, it, was, it hurt me a whole lot. You know, I'm, I'm, I, this whole offseason was to get ready to play and have a great season. And, uh, I want to play. Tony, what does it do for the union's position to have veterans such as yourself come into camp? I don't know. Uh, the way I feel about what's going on now is like they're not getting nothing done. And I went through a strike back in 82, which I lost a lot of money, and I don't like losing money. I, I feel that they had a, a lot, enough time to get this thing worked out. You know, I don't know. I don't know what, what goes on between the management and between the the union. But uh, that was five years ago before we struck. Last time we strike, and uh, now we're striking again. I mean, it, it, to me, that doesn't make sense. Uh, they have five years to work out a deal, and they don't start working it out until the last minute. It, it doesn't make sense to me the way things are going. And from from the understanding that I have now. They're not even talking. Tony Collins is the first veteran to cross the Patriots picket line. Coach Raymond Berry is virtually certain that Collins won't be the last. More of his real teammates are expected to report within the next few days. The NFLPA would like to see itself as a threatening, snarling dog. Right now, it looks a little bit more like a puppy with its tail between its legs coming back to its master. In Foxborough, Jack Edwards, Sports Center 5. All right, Jack, the obvious question now is, what about his teammates and how do they feel? Well, to answer some of those questions, we join Eddie Andelman's Sports Talk on WHDH, where tonight Eddie's guests are Mosi Tatupu and Lynn Dawson of the Patriots. And Eddie, I know Mosi is standing there right beside you or sitting beside you right now. I'd like to ask him a question. Uh, 
or are they not going to talk? Why are we seeing you? Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm delighted that they've been very open and very frank, and I've learned a lot myself, Mike, that it's not just free agency that's the problem, that there is another point of view on this strike. All right, let me get right to Mosi. Mosi, your reaction to Tony Collins crossing today? Well, I'm not very happy with uh, his decision to go in. Uh, there are 45, 44 other guys out here uh, standing strong, and uh, really, I'm, I, that's all I can say at this time right now, that I'm, I'm not very happy with his decision. I know in other strikes, particularly the baseball umpires, some substitute umpires came in, and that was years ago. They still did not talk to them, even though they travel with them on the same plane, stay in the same hotel, work in the same game. If and when this thing is over, do you anticipate that type of relationship with Tony Collins? Well, I'll, I guess I'll handle that when I when I cross that bridge. Uh, right now, I you know I just I have too too many other things to worry about. Will you cross the picket line before a settlement is reached? A lot of players I know are coming in tomorrow and Sunday. Will you or Lynn Dawson, who's beside you, cross? I know I'm not. Um, I'm standing firm, firm on my belief and this, this issue, and I'm, I'm not going to go in until this uh, agreement is settled. Mike, can I jump in here since this go is ahead, my Eddie. program? <laughs> uh, I want to ask uh, mostly one question and Lynn Dawson, and mostly that is if if you were playing against the caliber of, uh, that's going to be out there on the defense for the Cleveland Browns uh, this coming Sunday, how many yards do you think you would be able to gain if you played the whole game? Right now, I believe I, I can get over 200 yards against them. All right. Uh, Lynn, uh, I learned earlier in the program tonight that uh, the uh, free agency, as far as the players are concerned, is not the paramount issue. And I wonder whether you could explain to the Channel 5 viewers and our listeners once again, what is the status on the demands? Uh, right now, uh, they haven't addressed any of the issues uh, uh, other than if we don't get free agency off the table, we cannot negotiate any of the other terms. We're concerned about the $18 million that's owed in the pension f uh, fund that we negotiated in 1982. We're concerned about how they want to redistribute uh, the 25 of the $35 million excess, uh, how they want to do the severance as far as joining that with the pension. Uh, we don't have time to go into the specific details, but a free agency is not the issue. And in fact, Eddie, I believe that if they will move a little closer to us on the other issues and get something fair there, then maybe the other guys will vote to come back in and, and, and settle this thing. Eddie, let me jump in and ask one more question to Mosi and or Lynn. I don't know if Lynn can hear me. AFL-CIO came down today, and they said that they're going to cause a massive traffic jam in Sunday's game against the Browns. They're going to have buses down there and back traffic all the way up to Norwood. Is this what the players want? And if they don't want it, can they prevent it from happening? Well, we don't want it uh, to cause any uh, violence or anything of that nature. We, we're just trying to uh, show our, or voice our opinion out on the, out, out on the in front of the stadium that the the, the game that's being played is, is with uh, pretenders and not not the real Patriots. And as far as the uh, AFL CIO, uh, we we can't be more uh, uh, thankful enough for them for helping support uh, this cause here. And we're not trying to tie up anything or or, or jam any uh, traffic jam, have any traffic jam out there on Route One. I mean, it's it's already a traffic jam during a game anyway. Well, Mike, I tell you, we're going to send it back to you. But I'm just curious myself, uh, since you're a great kicker at Harvard and there's still work, uh, and you don't work on Sundays, is there any possibility of a Mike Lynch comeback? Uh, about as much chance as there is of you playing fullback for the Patriots on Sunday. Does that answer the questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Okay, so there you go. There you have it. Some uh, <laughs> frank and candid answers. Uh, bill was filed to save Suffolk today. I'm summarizing some things, obviously, because we went long there. NBA Players Association has filed suit against the owners. That's another strike we'll deal with down the road. And uh, Celtics signed Reggie Lewis, their top draft pick, too. All right. All right. That's it. All right. Coming up, a special moment in sports and in Boston's history. Look back at the 67 Sox 20 years later. Clark Booth's report is next. Here's a tender chicken price that's tough to beat. Even better, here's a sale at Purity and Angelo's on all kinds of chicken parts so you can cook up a storm of all your family's favorites, including meaty chicken wings at a price to make your mouth water, and fresh young whole chicken breast for only $1.19 a pound. 
and delicious chicken leg quarters for just 49 cents a pound. Purity, we're Angelos and me. Chicken Little's just a walking down the street singing Do I diddy diddy dum diddy do Kentucky Fried Chicken's got my favorite thing to eat singing Do I diddy diddy dum diddy do They look good, look good, taste fine, taste fine Only 39 cents, gotta have them all the time Kentucky Fried Chicken's new chicken little sandwiches They cost just a little, but people love them a lot Do I diddy diddy oh. dum diddy down south, it's soda, and up north, it's tonic. But at Zare, it's just four ninety six a case, and at that price, I'd call it a deal. Zare, how little it costs. In two days, the 21st century begins. Star Trek, the next generation, Saturday at 8 p.m. on Channel 5. If you can show me a penny, I'll show you how to turn it into a TV. What <laughs> magic. Just bring any penny into Rent-A-Center during Magic Penny Days, and it gets you your first week's rent on anything in the store. And that includes our full line of TVs, from this 20-inch RCA portable for just $12.99 a week, up to this 25-inch Zenith console with stereo sound, remote control, and swivel base for only $18.99 a week. Turn one cent into a full week's rent. Right now, during Rent-A-Center's Magic Penny Days. Of all the cars, on all the roads, there's one unconventional choice. An Alfa Romeo with four doors. The Milano. Its extraordinary aluminum V6 muscles up to 183 horsepower. And its provocative style will take you where you've never been before. The Alfa Romeo Milano. Driven to be different. Do you remember what you were doing 20 years ago today? Well, if you were a baseball fan living in these parts, then you only need to hear a few notes from the impossible dream to remind you. For well, this is the anniversary of an unforgettable day in local sports, sports lore, as our special correspondent Clark Booth fondly recalls. It was just a baseball season, another pennant race. But if you were young and alive in the summer of 67 and lived in New England, you know how it built like a castle in the sky. I honestly think we'll win more ballgames than we lose. They had been so bad so long, no one believed the brash and belligerent manager Dick Williams when he promised that. But then an obscure lefty, Billy Rohr, almost no-hit the Yankees. And Carl Yastrzemski started making plays like this. Well hit, Yastrzemski going back, going back, back. One-handed grab, he made the catch. It was when learned son of Stanford, Jim Lonborg, stood up against the Yankees, precipitating one of the more legitimate brawls in baseball history, that you realized something truly mysterious was afoot. It had been a long, long time since they'd held their ground against the Yankees. Both bullpens out. When they won 10 straight on the road in July, 10,000 people besieged them at the airport. Game after game, heroes rose who were rarely to be heard from after that season. The left field by Joe Foy, and this one is a grand And often it was Twilight Zone stuff, like the time Jose Tatabo's rickety throw to Ellie Howard saved them against the White Sox. And he is out at the plate! He is out at home! There was heartbreak en route the pitch from Jack Hamilton that destroyed the career of Tony Conigliaro. But every such tribulation was surmounted, and along the way, a legend was born. So it came down to one last game against the Twins, and if you were there, you will never forget how Lonborg uncorked the genie from the bottle with a little bunt. Base hit the center. Swinging away. Base hit the left. Ron Borg being held at third base. Base hit the center. Ron Borg scores. Adair will score. It's tied up. Yaz will go to second. A run will score. After the final out, Lomborg was swept off the field by a tidal wave of humanity, and you could hear the hallelujah chorus resounding from Eastport to Block Island. The Red Sox win it! And what a mob on this field! They're coming out of the stands from all over! 
In the life of every franchise, there can be only one moment like this. There were good times before, there have been good times since, and there will be still more good times ahead. But 1967 was in a class by itself. Of course, they lost the World Series, but that was thoroughly immaterial. Indeed, they may never win another one. But once upon a time, there was a season that redeemed all the failures, and it ended 20 years ago today. This is Clark Booth reporting. Goosebumps, huh? (laughs) Coming up, what's in store for the weekend? Another look at the forecast when we come back. get up here in the amazing isuzu trooper 2 of course near the top i did have to shift into four-wheel drive want to buy it no this are supposed to walk can it take all of us no sweat are you sure about this you have my word on it, word on it. test drive the rugged isuzu trooper 2 at these isuzu dealers now when i was a kid this was all i knew about fish but today i found the fresh fish department at stop and shop and they've shown me a whole ocean of possibilities. From fresh swordfish to scallops to haddock and snapper. Mmm, even recipes on how to cook it. Plus, it's good for me. Mmm, and good for my waistline, too. The fresh fish department at Stop and Shop. They've got more fresh fish than you can shake a stick at. It's time to stop and shop. It's here, the most electrifying sale event ever. Fredder's monstrous electronic event now through Sunday only. A sale so monstrous, it had to be held at the World Trade Center and all Fredder stores. For four days only, we're crushing high prices. Save on this front load VHS video recorder with wireless remote and on-screen programming, only $237. Or this Emerson 19-inch color portable TV, just $217. Run, don't walk, for huge savings at Fredder's monstrous electronic event. Fredder is better. Get smarter. Extra, extra, read all about it. Check Sunday's Globe and get the news. Lecture City brings you Boston's best prices on brand name televisions, VCRs, stereo systems, components, and more. Save like never before on Panasonic, Sony, JDC, Fisher. Get Boston's best prices. Get the Lecture City news in Sunday's Globe for extra, extra savings at all 12 locations. Lectra City. Well, as we reported at the beginning of this broadcast, an earthquake measuring 6.1 on the Richter scale rocked the Los Angeles area today. Now, our entertainment editor, Dixie Watley, just happens to be in L.A. on assignment. And she joins us now from Whittier, California. That's east of Los Angeles, where there's been a lot of damage. First, Dixie, where were you when the quake hit this morning? I was awake but in bed, and it just about shook me out. It was as if the room moved over about two feet and immediately moved right back again. And you, I sat there thinking, now, was this real? And quickly realized it was. And I think the immediate fear for all of us who have grown up in California and grown up with that threat of the big one, the immediate fear is where are you? Are you close to the epicenter? Is it worth somewhere else? Are your loved ones safe? And if it's as bad where you are, if the epicenter is, af- is far away, that it possibly could be the big one. This turned out not to be, as you said, at 6.1 on the Richter scale. Although there certainly has been extensive damage. We have five dead so far at la- at least la- the last report, about 100 injured. And I am now in Whittier, which is the epicenter where there is the most extensive damage. With me now is Officer Stan Reese. Officer Reese, what is the situation now where we are? Well, right now we have about 12 square blocks cordoned off just for the uh, public safety. And we're checking the uh, businesses and the residents in the area just to make sure that uh, we don't have anything that would cause any further uh, injury or uh, damage to anybody else in the area. I know immediately behind us you can see a building that has has sustained extreme damage here. Can you tell me a bit about this? Okay, basically the roof on that building has collapsed inside and the northern or top portion of the uh, building has fallen onto the sidewalk, but our city crews have since cleaned it all up just to get these areas uh, back to uh, normal, if we can call it normal right now. Do you think there's still any danger to people? There are quite a few people standing around here. Well, we're trying to keep people out of the area because of these buildings. Are, some of them are 60 and 70 years old, and they're basically all brick buildings. And because of the earthquake standards of those days and today, they're just not that safe at the present minute. Okay, thank you very much. A 12, 12 square block area here. These are old buildings. Many of them are still unsafe. 
Um, I'll tell you more on the 11 o'clock news as I get it. Back to you, Chet and Natalie. All right, Dixie, thank you. What a frightening experience that had to be for all of the people out in L.A. today. Uh, five dead now as Dixie updates the uh, figures from that quake. We'll have more for you at 11. Dick, I guess you had a couple of seconds to give us a quick forecast for this okay. area. Okay, I just wanted to tell you about, uh, I called the John Ovell, the doctor from uh, the uh, Western Observatory, and we're talking about New England earthquakes, and uh, we have about three to five every year, and the worst one here was a six on the Richter scale back in 1755 in Cape Ann, and for every year in Southern California, there's the same number of earthquakes they have there that we have in 150 years here in Ooh. Southern New England, so it's a far... New, more numerous uh, situation out there. We're just going to have some sort of partly cloudy skies tonight and uh, windy and warmer weather tomorrow. Over the weekend, it's going to be wacky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be back with the final note after this reply to a Channel 5 editorial. A recent WCVB editorial urged the Senate to pass a solid waste bill with tougher siting provisions. However, the abuses the editorial seeks to overcome have already been corrected in the House Pass version. Towns can't arbitrarily exclude trash facilities. The bill establishes uniform criteria which towns must use to substantiate approvals or denials. Towns can't treat solid waste facilities different from other permitted uses, nor can they revise their zoning to block such facilities. The bill precludes adoptions of prohibitory bylaws and zoning changes after a specified date. Finally, rejected facilities can appeal the decision. These bill provisions have been fully supported by environmental health and municipal organizations. The dissatisfied solid waste industry spreads confusion by refusing to acknowledge these significant siting reforms. Instead, industry has proposed last-minute amendments which undermine reasonable local siting authority and weaken legitimate environmental protections. Industry invokes an impending capacity crisis to justify their amendments. Ironically, their action has stymied the bill's progress and resolution of the crisis. Industry can demonstrate its sincere commitment to crisis resolution by abandoning these divisive amendments, accepting the existing changes, and urging the Senate to get on with it. All right, we well, thank you for joining us this evening. World News Tonight is coming up next. I'm Natalie Jacobson. And I'm Chet Curtis. We'll see you at 11. Good night. Have a nice evening.